On the 23rd of June 1993, something pretty insane occurred. Lorena Bobbitt cut off the penis of her husband, John Wayne Bobbitt, with a kitchen knife as he slept. Lorena drove for a short period of time before throwing the detached penis out of the driver's window. She told police where it was and they started digging around in the grass and eventually they found the severed schlong. And I kid you not, they then put it inside an ice box from a 7-Eleven and they rushed it to the hospital where urological and plastic surgery took place and they managed to reattach it. Shout out, by the way, to the surgeons who did that. I can't imagine it's an operation that they get to practice very often. I actually went to medical school, yes, all psychiatrists and medical doctors, psychologists or not. And I think I must have missed the lecture on reattaching disconnected fallacies. So what were the antecedents leading up to the chopped member? What was the psychiatric defense for Lorena during her trial? What was the aftermath both for Lorraine and also for John? And what do their behaviors tell us about the psychological makeup of each individual? How long does an operation take to attach a torn sausage? I will answer all of these questions and many, many more in this episode of A Psych for Sore Minds. So grab a 7-Eleven icebox, sit back, relax. I educate whilst you salivate. I mean, sorry. I educate whilst you vegetate. You Bombay. <laughs> Hello, cruel world. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. So the reason that I selected this case is that there's a lot of folklore and humor and silliness surrounding it. There's been Saturday Night Live sketches, stand-up routine, etc. understandably. But beyond all of this is the real story, which is much darker, and it hints of years of domestic abuse, violence, and rape. And as my area of expertise is assessing mentally disordered offenders, I thought I'd explore the psychological processes behind the victim and the perpetrator. So what I'm trying to say is this is not all just dick bait. I mean, sorry, clickbait. So what actually happened? What was the context? Well, there are two versions of events, much like your wedding night. Let's first look at the perspective from John Wayne Bobbitt, who, by the way, should not be mistaken for John Wayne, who's an American actor and filmmaker who starred in Western and war movies, who died in June 1979 with his genitals very much intact. In numerous documentaries, John Wayne Bobbitt has maintained that he planned to divorce Lorena and that after he denied her sex that night, she went in eventual rage and she cut off his penis while she slept. Lorena stated to the jury that John came back home drunk and he raped her and then she went into the kitchen to get a glass of water and she spotted the kitchen knife and overcome from years of abuse she went to stab him though she doesn't remember what happened and she said that she wasn't in her conscious mind. By the way you should go and check out my video on Valerie Bacco. So Valerie Bacco is a French woman who suffered a lifetime of abuse at the hands of her husband, who she eventually killed in March 2016 in France. So her husband, Daniel Pole, reportedly began raping Bacco when she was just 12 years old, when he was her stepfather. And then he forced her to marry him and fathered four children. He would slap her, he would kick her, he would choke her, uh, punch her. He even forced her into prostitution. So it's just a horrific, horrific case. Watch my video if you want to find out more about what happened and specifically about battered wife syndrome. Okay, back to our story. So what happened in the Bobbitt trial? Well, the defense and the prosecution both hired psychiatrists. This is what I do for a living. I work as an expert witness, so I give evidence in criminal trials. Basically, what I'm trying to say is I'm the real deal. Other true crime podcasters talk about it, but I'm actually about that life. I'm not saying that I'm better than you, but I am saying that you're worse than me. Okay, so the defense expert was called Dr. Susan Feister, and she made a diagnosis of major depressive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and also panic disorder. And she described Lorena as classic battered wife, weakened by years of abuse and fear. And she believes that Lorena became psychotic and did not have control over her actions. Whereas Dr. Miller Ryans, the prosecution expert, testified that he didn't doubt Lorena was raped. However, he did not detect any evidence that she was out of touch of reality or experienced any delusions at the time of the assault. So he concluded that her actions were not an irresistible impulse 
but rather an impulse that she did not resist. You get the difference, right? The defense evidence won the day and Lorena did get a finding of not guilty by reason of insanity. The standard for insanity in criminal responsibility varies by different states in the USA and also between different countries. So what that means is Lorena probably would not have got this defense in most other states in the USA. The basis of the American law is about irresistive impulses, which is different from the British law. The not guilty of insanity plea in British law is ruled by the Minorton rules, which is about whether they knew the nature of the act, and if they did, whether they knew it was wrong. I don't really have time to go into the mechanics of the medical legal aspects in this episode because I'm too busy and I'm too important. But if you're interested in this, you should go check out my other video on Yasmin. Yasmin is one of the most real life uh, shocking cases that I've assessed in person in my entire career to date. She was a teenager with no history of violence or mental illness or drug abuse, who in the grips of psychosis, she actually carried out a horrific, horrible, tragic act. I'm not gonna tell you about it more. If you wanna know more, go check out my video. It is fascinating. You Bombay. <laughs> So the term irresistible impulse was first used successfully as a defense in 1840, where a dude named Edward Oxford was indicted for treason because he attempted to shoot Queen Victoria. And the evidence back then for that defense hinged around his family history of insanity, as well as the dude's own prior insane acts. But this law was updated, or at least in, in some states, only three years later by Daniel McNaughton, who shot and killed the secretary of Sir Robert Peel, the prime minister, because he believed it was actually Robert Peel due to his many delusions. So this sparked off the insanity defense and the McNaughton rules, all of which they use today something I'm very familiar with. As I say, I give evidence in these kinds of trials. Let's get back to the story. John Wayne Bobbitt was charged with marital sexual assault and was later acquitted. Now this is kind of shocking. At the time, marital rape had only recently made, been made a crime in 50 states in the USA, and it was difficult to prove. So basically what I'm saying is, is if this had occurred a few years earlier, then the law would say that it's acceptable for a husband to rape his wife. And I kid you not, some news outlets at the time, such as Penthouse, denied the concept of marital rape. It just They just said it didn't exist. Obviously, this is a massively archaic and Neanderthal way of thinking. And these are not sort of hateful, misogynistic, fringe, underground movements. This was mainstream media. This all reminds me of the incel movement. So that's being involuntary celibate. They're kind of internet virgins who feel entitled to sex and they spread their hateful sexist vitriol. By the way, if you're interested about the incel movement, check out my video on Jake Davison. I was a guest on my boy Sean Atwood's uh, channel. Jake Davison is the young man who committed the horrific mass shooting in Plymouth in the UK in August 2021. He killed five random strangers, including his own mother. So as I alluded to before, Lorena was found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity by a jury. And I'll come back to that in a bit. By a bit of way of background, Lorena is originally from Ecuador and John was a former Marine. Numerous witness at the trial stated that they had seen bruises on Lorena's arms and her neck. And also witnesses stated that John had bragged to his friends about forcing his wife to have sex. So at times he even kicked her out of the house and she had to sleep in the nail salon where she worked. And she, at times she even had to sleep in her own car. Lorena had repeatedly called 911 asking for help in the past. So this is a pattern obviously of a woman being abused in the long term as opposed to, for example, retrospectively kind of excusing her actions. So dear viewers, can you guess how long it took urological and plastic surgeons to reattach John Wayne's bobbit disengaged appendix? The answer will be coming up shortly. So how long did that operation take? Drum roll please. It actually took nine and a half hours, which is pretty intense because surgeons barely get to have a break. They spend almost that entire time concentrating, operating on their feet. Shout out to all surgeons out there. I actually trained in surgery for a year, believe it or not, as a junior doctor. This was in Newcastle in 2004. I was a senior house officer in urology. <clears throat> so my professional work has exposed me to more than enough penises, thank you. Just like your social life. Okay, so what was the aftermath of this incident, both in general and also specifically for the severer and the severi, or should that be severed? The public made fun of the whole situation, as you probably would expect, such as the people in the hometown of where it happened, Manassas, selling t-shirts that say, love hurts, or Manassas, a cut above the rest. 
Who doesn't like a good pun? Or even two puns within the same title of a very cleverly worded YouTube channel. Borderline genius, you might say, or at least, yeah, I might say. However, I also think they missed a trick. They should have worn t-shirts which said, Manassas, where the most intense domestic disputes are orchestrated. Get it? Orchestrated? High five? High five? <laughs> Let's look at the aftermath of Lorena. In 1994, a year after the deadly detachment, she had a brief mandated stint in a mental hospital, and then she returned to continue her life as a manicurist. Lorena carried on living in her hometown of Manassas. She later did hair, and she also sold real estate. She attended a church where she met a new partner, a man called David Bellender. Sorry. David Bellinger. Could possibly be the bravest man of all time. They are now a happy couple with a teenage daughter. Lorena also started a non-profit organization that helps survivors of domestic abuse. So to me, it seems that Lorena just wanted to lead like a normal life. She refused to move despite having a lot of unwanted attention for many years. So she stayed in the home area, she stood her ground. This is in stark contrast to the aftermath of John. So he made pornographic films called John Wayne Bobbitt Uncut and John Wayne Bobbitt's Franken Penis. Now I know that sounds like the kind of cheap, tasteless joke that I would make because I'm desperate for attention and love, but I kid you not, that's actually true. Those are actually the names of the films that he made. John was also a regular on the Howard Stern show and Stern literally said, I don't even buy that he was raping her. She's not that great looking. That has aged like milk. Generally, I'm a fan of Howard Stern. Obviously, that was very tasteless. He'd probably be canceled nowadays, to be honest, and rightly so, I have to say. So, dear viewers, what do you think of Howard Stern? Let me know in the comments, him in general, and specifically those comments. John had been giving lots of interviews on TV shows, and he still is, and he's been getting paid to appear at events around the country, and I thought I was an attention whore. There are actually reports, it gets a bit darker now, because there are actually reports of an ex-girlfriend of John stating that he tied her to his bed in a New York apartment for several days and repeatedly raped her, and he was convicted and he spent time in jail, and he's been charged on more than one occasion as well as that with battery since then. So it really does seem like John is a piece of work, by which I mean a piece of shit. Lorena did a little bit of press, but she turned down several offers to make films or TV series. She turned down $1 million to pose for Playboy. So to me, this shows like her classiness and her dignity compared to John. Okay, what was the social context of this whole incident and why does it matter? Love to answer that. Before I do that, let me introduce you to the channel. My name's Dr. Shahan Das. I'm a consultant, forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders in courts and prisons and the psychiatric units. I'm also an expert witness, so I give evidence in criminal trials. I am your favorite London-based Asian British forensic psychiatrist, or at least in your top five. This channel dissects a whole range of issues. It's like a smorgasbord of mental illness, and criminality and the crossover between the two. I analyze high profile true tr crime cases. I also talk about individual diagnoses and I talk about criminality in general in terms, including theories, I interview people. What I'm trying to say is there's something for everybody, Shmon Shmish channel. I need you to subscribe, I implore you, because not only does it help me out immeasurably, but it stops you needing to wake up so many times in the middle of the night to micturate. Guaranteed or your money back. If you don't know what micturate means, maybe you need to invest in a dictionary. You're Bombay. <laughs> The timing of this whole incident, what happened with Lorena and John Wayne Bobbitt, coincided with a, a gradual kind of social feminist uprising. This included Anita Hill. In 1991, she gained fame and respect when she accused the US Supreme Court nominee, Clarence Thomas, her supervisor of sexual harassment, which brought forward the topic of misogyny and treatment for women in the workplace in general. This kind of stuff is kind of, is uh, very well publicized now and everybody seems kind of open to discussions about it now. And if you're of a younger generation, you should maybe appreciate that back in my day, or back in my day, things weren't like that. Um, you know, racism, sexism obviously existed, but it wasn't, it wasn't as, as easy or as open to talk about these topics as it is now. Anyway, on, on top of all of that, in 1994, OJ Simpson was arrested and later acquitted for the murder of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Golden. Me and Marcus Allen went over to see Nicole when we heard a knock at the door. Must have been Ron Gold. Jumped behind the door, put the party on hold. Killed them both and smeared blood in a white bronco. My mind won't work if my spine don't jerk. Sorry. 
That same year, Congress passed the Violence Against Women Act, which is obviously a massive step forward in terms of human civilization. The whole incident even polarized feminists, the incident that is with Lorena. Some defending Lorena and calling her brave, and others feeling that it made the sisterhood look a bit kind of unhinged and deranged. So she had friends and enemies who were feminists. Ye Bombay. By the way, see my video on the Wu-Tang Clan associate Christ bearer who cut off his own penis during a drug-induced psychotic episode. I kid you not, fascinating story, go check it out. It's kind of occurred to me that I now have two penis-related videos out of about 130 ones on my channel, so that's more than 1%. What is the acceptable proportion, dear viewers? Can somebody please let me know? I've tried to Google it and I couldn't find it. I did ask Jeeves, but he had no idea. Okay, so let's wrap this all up. To conclude, if you're as old as me, and I'm much older than I look, you would certainly would have heard of this case. At least half of you would be wincing, I imagine, when you heard about it. There's a lot of folklore, there's a lot of humor about this case, and it wasn't taken that seriously by a lot of people, but behind it all is the actual darker story which is about years of domestic violence and rape. Hopefully this video has educated you about the events and the psychological processes behind both the victim and the perpetrator. Also, we discussed the different ways that Lorena and John Wayne Bobbitt reacted and even tried to cash in on the whole incident. John Wayne Bobbitt's Franken penis. I'm not making that up. Whatever the dude lacks in length, he makes up for it in shamelessness. Is there anything else to talk about? Oh, yes, Megatron. Ah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a book coming out. You need to go buy that ish. So it is a bit like this channel, but it is about my life as a forensic psychiatrist, a lot more autobiographical. I talk about my life and my background and my training, and I talk about lots more of my own cases, all anonymized. I'd love you to go and buy it. Um, please spread the love and tell more people about this channel. I need more subscribers because I'm a weak man and I need love and validation. Maybe I wasn't hugged enough as a child. That's all I have to say. Stay euthymic and please remember whatever happens, do not forget. It's really important actually, really important. I love you.